Hey everybody, how's it going? Today I'd like to do a video on New York City real estate featuring my cat, Mr. Clinton. This is an interesting Wall Street Journal article. It says, pressure on New York City commercial real estate worries investors. Collapsing loan prices in Manhattan developments could be a sign of trouble ahead for commercial-backed securities. This article is going over the commercial real estate crisis that's going on right now, and a lot of people in New York City rightly predicted that eventually there would be a collapsing of the real estate market and that the bubble would pop. You don't have to be an expert in finance or in real estate to understand that what's going on is fundamentally unsustainable and crazy. Again, I am not a finance person. I fix MacBook laptop motherboards at component level. This is not my business. But when I was looking for a new repair shop location, uh, you could go through many of the videos that I did here. There is a common thread amongst most of these videos, which is that A, most of these places are dilapidated pieces of shit. B, they want insane amounts of money for all of them. C, they don't lower the price in spite of the fact that some of them are vacant for two or three or five or even eight years. Some of the places that I checked out in 2011 when I was looking for my new store initially we're still vacant in 2019. It's insane. So any normal person can realize something funny is going on there because typically if no one wants to buy your product for seven or eight or nine years, you may lower the price a little bit until people actually want to buy it. And I did a video a while back, expert breakdown of New York City's commer overpriced commercial vacancies, where I was reading a post from a gentleman named Laminar Flo that I'll link to below on Reddit, where he was going over the whole concept of commercial mortgage-backed securities. That... He says the banks don't hold these loans. They are parsed out to investors as commercial mortgage-backed security. So depending on the language in the CMBS origination document, you may have to say get 80% approval from the investors, which is difficult to approve even a single loan modification. And you may need a loan modification in order to rent out a property for less money. So if I base the value of the building on the fact that I can get 20000 for four of these retail stores, and then I have to rent it out for 15000 that lowers the uh, value of the building which means that the asset that is used as collateral is now worth less, which means that I, as the person who bought the building, need owe the bank money, which is, if I don't have the money, well, shit. So a lot of the problems with commercial real estate are based on the fact that a lot of this is based on funny money that people just kind of pulled out of their ass. A lot of the value inherent in these buildings is value on paper, not realized value, because it once you actually try to realize it, you re the, the value is not there. It's like having a stock and saying, this stock is worth $10 a share because I, I put in my sell order at $10, but if the all the, the highest bit available is two bucks, then your stock ain't worth shit. This is the problem with a lot of the commercial real estate in the city. And as much as this may be good for investors that the value stays high, it's actually bad for people because the people that live in that area now have to live in shitty apartments because there's an artificial scarcity of apartments because there's all these apartments that don't ever get rented out because if you actually rented it out at what people are willing to pay, the value of the building goes down, which screws with the investors. And you also have the issue with real estate. Businesses like mine would do great in other spaces, but we can't rent those spaces because they are going for a stupid amount of money and nobody's ever going to rent that space at that stupid amount of money because it's stupid. And if they lower the price of it, it screws with the investors, which means that businesses have less space to do business. It creates a less vibrant city when you have less people there. You have less businesses. You have people that are living in shittier apartments. They're crammed into more. They're crammed into smaller apartments, which means they're more frustrated, aggravated, stressed out. And the businesses themselves, like mine, where I, when I was cramming, you know, 13 people in a 600 square feet with customers, I could have had a nicer space, but I couldn't because they're, they're not designed to be rented. They're designed to be used as a little placeholder for funny money investments. This, this is a big problem. And a lot of people like me are excited at the idea of this finally coming tumbling down. However, what I think a lot of people are going to realize, and unfortunately in a painful manner, is what is said in this Wall Street Journal article. Investors watch New York closely because Wall Street splices such loans up, packages them together into bonds and sells them to pension funds and asset managers worldwide. Many consider the city a bellwether, and collapsing loan prices in Manhattan developments could be a sign of trouble ahead for the more than half a trillion dollar market for so-called commercial mortgage-backed securities. What that means is that even if you're someone that doesn't like New York City, has never been to New York City, thinks New York City culture is repulsive, thinks New York City politics are repulsive, thinks New York City people are repulsive, doesn't like New York City kitty cats, that you may actually be invested in New York City commercial real estate and not know it. You, you know, again, your company may be invested in it, and once that crashes, they may have less money available to pay you. 
your pension may be in it, which means your pension may go down. A lot of money is tied up in this. As they say, more than half a trillion dollar market for these commercial mortgage-backed securities, a lot of them in New York City, and they are most certainly crashing in value. My accountant uh, came by the other day. I usually see him about once a month. Uh, me, um, we discuss business, but then we also spend some time just shooting the shit because he likes telling stories. I like telling stories back and forth, and we kind of get along like that. So he was telling me a story about some of his commercial property owners in New York City, and he was saying, you know, I have, I have clients coming up to me and saying their tenant will come up to them, not a tenant that owns a tiny office. I mean a tenant that owns two or three floors of a large building, and they'll just say, here are the keys, you know, best of luck to you. And then he'll, the client will say, you know, you have nine years left on your lease. What are you talking about? And they'll go, well, yeah, but no, we, 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 our people are working from home now. And they'll just hand over the keys and they'll say, well, you know, you owe us money for breaking the lease. And the client will just say, well, you know, see us in court. They, they don't care. The client doesn't care. They're more than happy to risk paying a penalty or they're willing to just bet on the fact that the courts are going to be so backed up from the clusterfuck over the next several years that they're probably, by the time they see their day in court, they'll probably be dead. This is, um, like, and here's, yeah, I got to think about this. A lot of businesses have shifted when they wouldn't have otherwise shifted. J let's just take my gym habits. You know, like I have not, I've been saying since I was 17 years old, I want to get a gym at my place so that I don't pay a gym membership and that I don't have to physically visit a gym or take a bus or a train or a bike to a gym. I just want to be able to work out as I please. And I put off doing that for 14 years. I finally did it once coronavirus hit because I was not able to go to a gym anymore. Now that I've done that, I will likely never go to a commercial gym ever again because the convenience of being able to just, you know, wake up, do my workout as I please, uh, and, and then leave and you know, not have to worry about changing clothes, not have to worry about sharing shit with other people, not have to pay another monthly bill, and above all, have the inconvenience of having to commute somewhere when I don't want to. I, it's great. And this moment forced me to do something that I was just procrastinating for 14 years. With offices, Having people work from home is very difficult. You need a way to monitor if they're actually doing their job without being able to see them. If people are having trouble, you can't see them or hear them the same way that you could if you're a manager that has that hands-on experience. So you need to learn how to manage people uh, remotely, and you also need to come up with systems that allow you to manage people remotely. Above all, you need to hire people you can trust to work remotely. Some people work great in person, but trying to get them to work remotely just doesn't work, which means you may have to make staffing changes. A lot of companies just didn't want to deal with this when they already had a company that was profitable and made sense with them paying out the ass for real estate. But once they were forced by the government to close their offices, they had no choice. It was either people work from home or people don't work at all and your company goes to complete shit rather than just partial shit. So they came up with systems to allow people to work from home. Once you do that, once you put in that work, once you stop procrastinating and put in the investment to allow people to work from home, why why rent $150,000 of office space a month? Like, why do that? Maybe instead of having this much office space, you only need this much office space. Once that happens, you're going to be handing your keys back. And when you hand your keys back, you're probably not going to go back to normal once COVID is over. And this is not just a bad thing for the commercial mortgage-backed securities and the pension funds and everybody who invested in them. It's also a mess for the city. You'll hear a lot of the local politicians in New York City talking about how the rent is too high, these developers are evil, these developers and doing all their building of these expensive properties that the 1% live in is evil. We don't want any more you know, gentrifying in our neighborhoods. It's bad. Most of these are the same politicians that are not going to cut spending in any way, shape, or form that have no seeming idea that most of the city revenue comes from real estate property tax. So real estate tax is over 50% of New York City's revenue. And real estate property tax is 88% of that. So most of the revenue in New York City is not coming from your personal income tax, not coming from sales tax, not coming from corporation or business tax or anything else. It's coming from real estate tax. So the fact that these buildings are priced as ridiculously as they are, the fact that we have all these vacant storefronts and these vacant buildings that are paying property tax based on the inflated value of their building, which is a result of there not being people there, is why city politicians have these uh, lavish budgets to spend as they please. And at the end of the day, I kind of wonder, as much as the New York City politicians will rail against high rents, rail against the fact that there are these retail and, and residential vacancies that they don't like, are they kind of benefiting from the fact 
that those vacancies allow them to pretend the building is worth more, which allows the city to make more property tax. I don't think the city has any, they're not going to cut their budget in any meaningful way at all. They've talked about maybe $1 billion in cuts to the police department. I mean, the whole defund the police thing is funny to me because once this crashes, I mean, you're defunding everything. So my accountant told me that that commercial building owner has no intention of paying his property taxes because all of his tenants in the entire building handed the keys and said, you know, best of luck. Uh, And when his client said, you know, you can't do that, he said, see us in court. We're not paying. You know, best of luck getting the money from us. It's not going to be there. And even if they do wind up going to court three to five years from now, that company is probably going to be like, that company is going to be long bankrupt by then. The the landlord's never getting their money. And what I find particularly interesting here is when you look at the plan for, let's just say, real estate taxes, they actually believe that it's going to keep going up and up and up. So New York City's budget is based on the idea that they're going to be collecting more money year after year in property tax, which I don't see happening in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. I, just, I don't see 2021 collecting more money in real estate taxes than 2020. That's not happening. Even when coronavirus is 100% done and dealt with, you have all these companies that realized, I don't need this space anymore. And they're probably not going to go back the same way that I'm probably not going to go back to my commercial gym membership. One part I want to push back against is when it says here, a few think the market is about to collapse entirely. Many said that while New York has further challenges ahead, including swelling deficits and potentially lower tax revenues, the city rebounded after the 9-11 terrorist attacks and the 2008 financial crisis. There are very large differences between the 9-11 attacks, 2008 financial crisis, and what happened in 2020. Let's go over them. So 9-11, what was that? That was a terrorist attack. A terrorist attack scared the crap out of everybody in the city, and it caused a lot of people at the time to say, I'm not getting into a skyscraper and going to the 46th floor. Screw that. I remember my dad, he used to work at the Plaza Hotel, then Club Quarters in uh, Midtown, and he got offered a job in this restaurant. I think I forget the name. It was like Windows of the World, Windows on the World. It was this restaurant that was in the top floor of the World Trade Center, and he interviewed for the job. He, he would have got paid better to be a chef. I think he was applying to be the first cook or something like that. My dad was an amazing chef. And he just said, you know, something didn't feel right and I didn't take the job. And then like, you know, I think it was months later or a year later or something, the 9-11 attack happened. And with his job schedule, he would he would be dead. And it's just one of those one of those things where he was very happy he didn't take it. And he told me, you know, I don't know how I feel right now about going to the hundredth floor of any commercial building. People were scared. However, at the same time, while people were scared, There were many people who were not scared who just went back to their normal everyday life and said, you know, screw this. I'm not going to let a terrorist attack change the way that I live my life or, you know, affect whether or not I want to do business in these areas. And yet you had a gigantic cost for the cleanup. You had a gigantic cost for reconstruction. There were gigantic costs involved with paying the people who were doing cleanup, the police, the firefighters that were injured or hurt that were never going to have, you know, they have all this crap in their lungs from the debris and all that stuff. All of that costs money, but fundamentally... People had the choice to go about their normal lives. In 2008, you had a financial crisis, but at the end of the day, it was just, mis, let's say, just misallocation of funds, or, and as a result of the misallocation of funds, there was less money available for businesses. But if people had money or some way to get money, they could still go about their lives and do business. It was just, you know, you had a financial crisis. What happened in 2020 is the government saying, Even if you're not afraid of coronavirus, even if you have protections for yourself against coronavirus and you're you're, you're masking and social distancing and all that, if you're not essential, you can't go back to work. Even if you want to go back to work, are okay with going back to work, are not afraid of going back to work, you can't. Now, whether or not you think that's the right way to go about handling it, I'm not getting into that in this video. The morals and ethical implications as to whether or not the government has the power to do that, whether they should have done it or shouldn't have done it, I'm not getting into that because that detracts from the point. The point is that that is the reality. The 2020 reality is that even if you are Even if you have money, which you didn't in 2008, and even if you are not afraid, which many people are in 9-11, even if, like, regardless of that, you're still not capable of going back to work. So this is going to be very different than it was back then. This is going to have a much larger effect because this is not simply a financial crisis, nor is it simply an issue where people are afraid to go back to their jobs. This is an issue of not only is there an economic crisis, 
But even if you are willing and able and financially able to spend money at certain businesses, you are legally unable, incapable of doing so because those businesses cannot legally go back to doing business. Even if they could go back to doing business, you would still have a slump because a lot of people would probably say, you know, screw that. I'm not going to a crowded restaurant right now. I, I, I don't feel like getting Corona. And I I probably wouldn't go back to a gym or a crowded indoor restaurant right now either because I don't feel like getting that shit either. But even the people that would want to do that, they can't. So fundamentally speaking, this is not the same situation as 2008 or 2001 in any stretch of the imagination. And to pretend that, well, we bounced back in 2001 and 2008, so we'll definitely bounce back from this, it's a totally different situation. And I don't think that it, people are going to bounce back in the same way. Because once you force people, once you twist their arm to figure out a new way of doing business, the, if that new way of doing business is considerably cheaper than the old way of doing business, then why would you go back to the old way of doing business? It would make no sense. So I think that this is going to crash in a terrible way. I think that the people comparing this to 2001 and 2008 are being very short-sighted. I do think that we are eventually going to figure out just how many people are invested in New York City real estate without knowing it as it mentions in this article. Investors watch closely because Wall Street splices such loans up, packages them together into bonds, and sells in the pension funds and asset managers worldwide. You know, how much of your portfolio, how much of your retirement fund, how much of how much of your financial institution that may have given you a loan for your car or your house may be invested in the New York City commercial real estate market, which I believe 120% is fully going to shit. No coronavirus. This was still a Ponzi scheme. Without coronavirus, in my opinion, this was a complete and utter Ponzi scheme. With coronavirus and mandates that you cannot go back to work, you cannot do business, uh, combined with the economic effects of everything that's gone on, combined with the fact that a lot of people are frankly just saying, "Screw this! I'm not going to. A, I'm not going to some crowded movie theater where everybody's yelling and applauding and droplets everywhere. I don't, I'm not getting sick. I, I don't see this going back to normal anytime soon." The real question here is how long will it take for a crash to happen? It has to happen. It's going to happen. At some point, someone's going to recognize that you have, you know, the ask for your on your stock trade is $10 and everybody's bid is 2 bucks. You just you can't pretend that that stock is still worth $10. Curious what you all think in the comments down below. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. By the way, some people may wonder why it is I'm viewing Wall Street Journal on archive.is rather than paying for a subscription. I actually pay for several pieces of journalism. I pay for Bloomberg, a monthly subscription. I paid for, uh, I think it was the information once. I paid, for, I paid for them as well. I believe in paying for journalism. The Wall Street Journal has a specific policy that I find repugnant and disgusting, where if you want to sign up for the Wall Street Journal, you can easily do so online with a click of a mouse. If you want to cancel, you need to call them. And then you get tossed back and forth and juggled from department to department, transferred from person to person, and you have to wait on hold for a fairly long period of time. However, if you trick the system and tell them that your billing is ac actually in California, not in any other state, what they'll do is they'll allow you to cancel online. So you could sign up easily online, but if you want to cancel, you have to call and go through a miserable system. And my guess as to why they do that is because they know that less people are going to cancel or they're going to procrastinate if they have to wait on hold and call in. But in California, I think there's probably some sort of, I imagine there's some sort of law that prevents them from doing that. So if you trick them by telling them your billing info is in California, they will then allow you to have a cancel button. I find that repugnant and uh, disgusting. You know, again, I've had... I have a forum. Uh, I because it was using PayPal for membership. You had to log into your PayPal account and cancel. You couldn't cancel on my forum. It did not have a connection to PayPal. We've since changed that since we now use Stripe for the forum. But at, at you had the ability as a user to cancel inside your own PayPal account. And the idea that you would put in place a barrier on purpose that serves no purpose whatsoever and to aggravate people in hope that they just wind up not canceling their account, to me is absolutely fucking disgusting and ensures that I will never pay for the Wall Street Journal ever again over the course of my lifetime until they change that policy. That's it for today. And as always, Mr. Clinton hopes that you learned something. That's my cat. His name is Mr. Clinton. See you later.